Hello everybody, my name is Haley and I'm a sophomore here at Central and welcome to Chi Alpha. If you haven't already, comment in the chat on either side of me to let us know that you're here because we're super glad that you're joining us. So last Friday's spring camp out prayer message, so good you guys. Nancy, you really brought the heat. Something I really enjoyed about the message is the fact that we really broke down prayer into understanding why we pray. And I like that she really emphasized that every time we pray, we're glorifying God. And because we can pray anytime, anywhere, we can glorify God anytime, anywhere. And if you missed that message, don't even worry. This upcoming Friday at 7 p.m., we're gonna have another prayer message from another student speaker. I'm super excited to see any of you guys there. And if you don't have access to the meeting, it's gonna be on Zoom again. And your core facilitator is someone you should contact if you need the link to the call or the call ID or, and password. And so again, just to remind you, it's this Friday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. I'm so excited to see your lovely faces, some of your lovely blanket forts, and for certain individuals, your propane blowtorch that you use to roast marshmallows with. So my final announcement is about tithing and giving. If you'd like to tithe, please click on the link above me somewhere that says donate. And if you want to give specifically to missionaries, all you need to do is go to that same button and change the recipient to missionaries. So now if you'll join me in prayer for the message. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this means of communication and this technology that we have right now in this day and age that can keep our community strong in a time of uncertainty. Um, God, I want to pray for tithing and giving, and I pray that you speak to all of us individually and let us know what exactly we can contribute, whether that be money or time. Um, God, and I just pray that you are with Ethan tonight and that you bless him and that you're speaking through him and that the words that he tells us are of you, God, and that after tonight, the message just resonates with us so deeply that we can't help but go spread the word and spread the message about you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, without further ado, let's get settled in for our message. Hey everyone, hope you're all doing well. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Ethan. Uh, I'm an intern here at Chi Alpha. And this is my little friend Domino, one of Marissa and I's two cats. Um, so if you hear any weird noises during this message, it's probably them, or it could be Marissa. I think Domino, yep, there it goes. Domino's done with the spotlight. Um, <laughs> yeah, so like I was saying, I hope you guys are all doing well. hope you guys are all staying uh, healthy and happy uh, emotionally and, and, you know, the stresses of online classes aren't, aren't tearing you guys down. So, yeah, I just really hope that, that you guys are all really emotionally healthy in this time. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're going to continue through our series on the Holy Spirit. Um, and before we do that, I have a few questions, uh, and then I'd like to share a story with you. Um, so, does following God ever feel like you're playing a waiting game? Like you're waiting for a response to prayer, uh, waiting for guidance and discernment, maybe waiting for a friend to respond to a message. Um, I think right now it really feels even more than ever like we're just waiting. Uh, like the world's on hold uh, and we've just got to kind of figure out what to do about it. Um, yeah, so we're kind of all just stuck in this, this state of waiting. Uh, it's kind of weird. So my story has a little bit to do with waiting as well. Uh, it's actually a story of how Marissa and I started dating. Uh, it's pretty, pretty fun for me. Um, if you don't know, Marissa and I are, are married. We've been married for nine months starting, or not starting, nine months today, uh, the 28th, this Tuesday. So um, yeah, it's been an interesting first year for sure. You know, who would have who thought this would be what we're facing, but you know. That's why it's uh, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, um, for bad, for worse, all that stuff. So, but anyway, back to my story. Sorry, I got a little sidetracked there. Uh, yeah, so we started, or we first met, actually, my freshman year of college, which was five-ish years ago now. Um, back then, I looked a little something like this. The long hair is definitely starting to come back with quarantine. It's very, very fun. Um, Marissa wants me to get my hair cut. I'm not sure if I trust her enough to give me one, but maybe we'll see. Eventually she'll get tired of it and I'll have to relent on that. But anyway, uh, yeah, so Marissa and I met the winter quarter of my freshman year. 
um, and became really good friends very quickly. Um, we were both coming off of recent breakups, so that was an interesting dynamic. But um, overall, we weren't looking for anything. We just kind of were wanting friends. Um, and we found that in each other really easily. Uh, I know for me, at least, Marissa was very easy to talk to. She was funny. Most importantly, she thought I was funny, which was great. Um, <laughs> back then, that, my comedy was kind of the one thing I, I felt like I had. Um, and she helped me to learn that I had more than that, but it's a different story. Uh, anyway, so fast forward a little bit from when we met to uh, spring quarter during the spring camp out, uh, which was, it, spring camp out is my favorite favorite retreat um, for you as freshmen that haven't been able to go to it uh you know go next year for sure because it is great it's an awesome time s'mores dogs are the best and you really got to experience that uh to truly live in my opinion um but anyway so during the spring camp out uh, i was sitting with marissa and with her facilitator leanne uh, who is an intern at that time uh, and leanne turned to me and said, so, when are you going to ask out my girl? And let me tell you, I was not ready for that question. Um, I felt very, very awkward and did not want to answer it in front of Marissa. You know, a 19-year-old me was a little skittish, for sure. So that was, that was fun um, to be put in that situation. But, uh, you know, I was kind of prepared a little bit because I'd already planned on talking to Leanne um, about Marissa. Um, which, side note, if you are interested in anybody uh, in Chi Alpha, I would highly recommend talking to their facilitator because that's the person that, that knows them, you know, somewhat the best in Chi Alpha and is going to be able to tell you whether they're spiritually ready to date. Um, so that little note off to the side. Uh, Leanne and I had a really good conversation and she gave me some of the best advice I've ever had, which was don't date. Yeah. Um, she said, you know, it's spring quarter. It's the end of April. By the time you start dating, you're going to have about a month together. And then two to three-ish months of separation because we lived on opposite ends of the state. Um, she said, you don't, do you really want to start your relationship off long distance? It's not going to set you up for success. And so luckily, <laughs> thankfully, Marissa and I listened to that advice. We had a conversation and we decided, you know, we both know that we want to date, but we also know that it's not smart for us to start yet. So we're just going to continue to focus on our friendship, focus on ourselves and get ourselves right um, through this time. And ultimately that, that distance really let us know that we did want to date because <laughs> there's nothing like being separate to kind of make feelings go, like a crush go away, right? Um, so yeah, waiting was super beneficial for us. Um, Marissa might tell you that I waited too long because the school year starts in September and we didn't start dating until October. So that was kind of on me, but you know, I was really into waiting back then. <laughs> she just laughed from the kitchen. So she can tell you that it's true that I was super into waiting. Anyway, uh, so tonight as we continue through our message series on the Holy Spirit, we are going to go through Acts chapter 1, uh, and we're going to learn about a time when Jesus asked his disciples to wait and receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, and as we go through, I'm going to lay out five lessons that we can learn from, <laughs> from Acts chapter 1 and how those lessons impact us. And so right off the bat, we're going to start with uh, point number one, which is that God is a God that values waiting. So we are a people who should wait. I'll say that again. God is a God that values waiting. So we are a people that should value to wait, or that should wait. Got my words a little mixed up there. So yeah, <clears throat> the book of Acts is an amazing story of God filling his people with the Holy Spirit. And through this filling, the gospel is spread all the way from Jerusalem to Rome. And it all starts with one command. Wait. Wait, and then work. Have you ever wondered why the book of Acts is called Acts? What acts are being acted? Who is acting? 
Well, I believe that it is the Holy Spirit that is acting. How is he acting? Well, through his people. What do they do? They tell people the gospel of Christ's kingdom all the way from Jerusalem to Rome, like I said. Um, so yeah, let's just dive into the book um, in Acts 1. So just turn to Acts 1. We're going we're gonna to start in verse 1. I don't know about you guys, but I kind of miss the Bible passers. It's kind of fun to, to have people come up to the front and, and watch people raise their hands if they wanted a Bible. Uh, anyway, so let's start in Acts 1, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering... He presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, we're going to stop right here, three verses in, because we got to we got to ask some questions. What what is the writer of Acts, Luke? What is Luke talking about? What did Jesus teach and do? What instructions did he give? What did he say during the 40 days about the kingdom of God? What were these things that, that Luke is referencing? Now, have you ever read a book series and started in book two? No, that doesn't make any sense. You have to start at the beginning, right? So we have to actually turn to Luke's first book, which is entitled Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and get a sense of what he's talking about. So let's turn to Luke chapter one, and we're going to read all the way through Luke. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. That would take a little bit too much time than we have. Um, So if you could actually turn to Luke 24, we're going to read verses 36 through 49. Luke 24, 36 through 49. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of the joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, He took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Now there's a couple cool things that we see in here. Um, Essentially, it's a little bit of what Luke was saying at the beginning of Acts chapter 1. So he starts off by saying, Peace be with you, which is the English translation for... uh, Assalamu alaikum in Arabic, or shalom alaikum in Hebrew, which Jesus spoke Aramaic, so it would have sounded something similar to that, which essentially means, hello, chill, relax. I'm here. It's nice to see you. (laughs) Um, And then in uh, verses 38 through 39, we get a glimpse of the proofs that Luke was talking about in Acts 1-3. And then Jesus, so we see here that Jesus came back, proved that he was alive, and then taught his disciples that his death and resurrection was a fulfillment of the scriptures. So we have this background that Luke was talking about in verses 1 through 3. So let's turn back to Acts chapter 1. And now we're going to pick it back up where we left off in verse 4. Give you a second to get there. All right. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, 
But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. All right, let's pause again. Things are getting juicy now. It's looking good. Like, this is the beginning of the entire ministry of Christianity. This is the ste stepping off point that will take Christianity from a few hundred Jews to a worldwide religion, which culminates currently in you and me. In us. <laughs> and it's crazy. Like, things are getting intense. And like all good worldwide movements, how does this one start? With a command to wait. And stay put. That doesn't really make sense to me. How can you start a worldwide movement if you don't move? Why would Jesus make them wait? Does Jesus know what he's doing? As it turns out, yes, he does. And there's a very, very specific reason that Jesus knew it was necessary to tell his disciples to wait. And it's to follow his example. What did Jesus do in his time of ministry? Well, he went around teaching the good news, healing all who were under the power of the devil. Wouldn't that be natural for his followers to do the same? But they weren't ready yet. They didn't have something that was absolutely crucial to their ministry. And what was that? Well, to get that answer, we have to look at how Jesus started his ministry, too. He started after he was baptized in water and in the Holy Spirit. Well, there he is, the Holy Spirit. It can't be a, spirit, uh, can't be a series on the Holy Spirit if we don't talk about him. So, he, of course, he's coming up. In fact, it's, it's very interesting because if you look at verse 5, what Jesus says here is almost an exact quote from something that John the Baptist said about Jesus prior to his ministry, prior to his baptism. In Luke 3.16, it says, or John says, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Intense. And a spoiler alert for you that don't know, Something like this might be coming up somewhat soon after Acts 1. If you want to read that part, I would suggest you read Acts 2. Okay, so this comment that John made all the way to the beginning of Jesus' ministry is a few days away for these disciples. That is insane. What do you think is going on in the heads of these disciples? Are they freaking out? Jesus said they're getting baptized by the Holy Spirit in a few days. I would be getting incredibly excited, probably going a little bit crazy in my head. What about you? What would you be thinking? Wouldn't you, would you have questions? What questions would you ask Jesus? Some of the ones that I would probably ask are, all right, so what do we got to do to get ready? Do we need like a tub uh, or a pool? Or are we just going to get baptized in the river? Um, and then does, does the Holy Spirit need a bed? Um, and what thread count sheets does he like? Um, and does, like, what does he like to eat? Does he have any food allergies? These are kind of dumb questions, right? To ask about a spirit. To ask about the spirit. Well, I am human. And as it turns out, so are the disciples because they also ask a dumb question. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you kidding? Jesus just died, came back to life, and then just told you that in a few days you're going to get baptized by the Holy Spirit, which 
if I heard John the Baptist correctly, is going to include some sort of fire. And you want to ask if Jesus is going to overthrow the Roman rule over Jerusalem? I would love to know the thoughts that came into Jesus' head at that moment. But Jesus knows his disciples. He knows that this is what they were taught, that the Messiah would come and overthrow the enemy. And the enemy that Jerusalem faces right now is the Romans. Does that make sense? And he has patience for his followers. In fact, he doesn't really even answer their question. He just kind of brushes it off and goes back to his point, which is verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. Which brings us to point two. God is a God that gifts. So we should eagerly desire his gift, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Again, that was God is a God that gifts. So we should eagerly desire his gift, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I think that Jesus' disciples understood this time. Not only is the Holy Spirit coming, but he's given out power. And then the whole world is going to know about Jesus. Now that is how you start a worldwide movement. All right, we're fired up now, Jesus. Let's go do this thing. Let's spread your name among the world. Let's see what happens next. In, uh, in verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Okay. So Jesus is gone now. He's no longer with the disciples. So I guess they just wait. How do you feel about waiting? Do you love it? <laughs> do you know anyone that loves waiting? But waiting is so worth it. Because God is giving you and I what we need to love our friends in this time of current waiting. Like I mentioned earlier, Marissa and I wanted to date, but we knew that we needed to wait. And it was one of the keys in our relationship. Waiting is extremely beneficial, especially here for the disciples. Jesus wants them together. He wants them waiting and praying and preparing for the Holy Spirit together. And why are they waiting? What about the Holy Spirit is worth waiting for? Well, that brings us to the third point, which is the baptism with the Holy Spirit gives us power, courage, and love to tell our friends about Jesus. The baptism of the Holy Spirit gives us power, courage, and love to tell our friends about Jesus. The Holy Spirit's purpose is to give us power and ability to share the gospel. And guess what? Something else very cool happens when we are empowered by the Spirit. Just like these first disciples, which you'll see in Acts 2, we will speak in tongues. 1 Corinthians 14.4 teaches us that tongues is a wonderful blessing because when we pray in tongues, God strengthens us. It says that anyone who speaks a tongue edifies himself or themselves. So what does edify mean? Well, it's a very old-fashioned noun for a house, an edifice 
if you will. And how do you make a house? Well, you build it. So to edify is to build up, to strengthen. When we pray in spiritual tongues, we are built up. We are made strong and sturdy, like a house, like a really solid house. We're going to move forward to my fourth point, which is that tongues are an amazing gift to strengthen us every day to live wholeheartedly for Jesus. Tongues is an amazing gift to strengthen us every day to live wholeheartedly for Jesus. All right, so let's just get back into Acts 1. So Jesus has just left, but the disciples can't just sit and do nothing. So let's see what they do in verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. Quick side note, this Judas is a different Judas than the one that betrayed Jesus. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas the one who betrayed Jesus, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is, the field of blood. For, said Peter, It is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time when the Lord Jesus was among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you will have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. So during this time of waiting, the disciples decide to be productive and find a replacement for Judas. And this leads to to something pretty interesting to me. Uh, How many of you know what casting lots is? I am willing to bet not many. Well, casting lots is, I'm going to give you a very me answer. (laughs) It's essentially the way that the ancient Jews determined God's will. It's sort of like a dice roll. And it's seen throughout the Old Testament. When something needs to be decided, they say, well, let's see what God says. Let's roll these dice. They're not actual dice. Let's roll these dice, and the outcome will be determined by God. Kind of interesting, right? Now, why do I point this out? Can you name a single time in the New Testament that casting lots is brought up again? No. No. Because this is the last time it ever occurs in the Bible. Why? Well, what is the event that happens directly after this? The day of Pentecost. The day when the Holy Spirit comes and baptizes the disciples. The disciples no longer need to cast lots in order to determine God's will because... They can just ask him now. 
the Holy Spirit now dwells in them and helps his people hear his voice. It's a crazy change. So where does that leave us? I don't know about you, but right now it feels like we're playing a waiting game. We can't go out and meet new people. But does that mean that ministry is dead? Absolutely not. There are people in all of our lives that need to know Jesus. Maybe there is someone that God has been asking you to reach out to, but you've been too busy. Well, are we too busy now? Maybe you've been feeling a dryness in your relationship with God, like it's a desert, and you've just been going through the motions hoping that something will change. Well, now is a great time to make that change. Now we can decide to get closer to God and read his Bible every day, which truly, truly helps. And maybe you've just been pushing yourself too hard and you haven't been taking the Sabbath rest that the Lord commands. Now is a great time to do that. My point is, is that right now is not a waste of time. It's a time to reset and reevaluate. We have time to do it. So let's do it. Maybe you're like me and you could use a refilling of the Holy Spirit, a daily refilling. What's to stop us from doing that? And that is the fifth and final point. We need a constant refilling of the Holy Spirit. You don't just get filled with the Holy Spirit and then that's it. You're good. The Holy Spirit is something we need to be filled with consistently, daily. I mean, do you eat breakfast in the morning and then you're good for food for the rest of the day? No, you got to keep eating. Sometimes more than three times a day. Usually more than three times a day. And if you're me, most of the time you don't even have breakfast. So you really need to eat. If you're going through the 28-day challenge through Acts, you saw that many times the disciples were filled again with the Holy Spirit. So to conclude, here are those five points again. <clears throat> God is a God who waits. We are a people who should wait. Number two, God is a God who gifts. We should eagerly desire his gifts of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Three, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is to give us power, courage, and love to tell our friends about Jesus. And number four, tongues is an amazing gift to strengthen us every day to live wholeheartedly for Jesus. And fifth, we need a constant refilling with the Spirit. So now we're going to head into our time of reflection. And I have some discussion questions for you to talk about with your cores. And they'll be up on the screen at the end, but I'll just say them now. And then I'll, I'll pray to close. So what is God asking me to wait for? And how am I doing it actually waiting for it? How can I be ready to fulfill Acts 1-8's command to be witnesses. What practices can I start working on now? And number three, have I been baptized with the Holy Spirit? What's stopping me? And we would like to encourage you to pray to be filled by the Holy Spirit and especially to ask your, your core members and your leader to pray for you to be filled in this time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray to close now. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much for this community of believers. Um, it's really an honor to, to share an online church with these people. I pray that you would be filling us during this time uh, of quarantine, that you would remind us that this is not a waste, that this is not 
just a time where we can chill, do things for our own, but that you are still active in everyone's life and that you are still doing ministry, God. Lord, I pray that you would fill us more with your Holy Spirit, that you would be active and present in our minds and in our hearts, that we would remember you daily, that you would fill us daily. And for those of us who have yet to be filled by your Holy Spirit, Lord, I ask that you would do that for us tonight. I ask that you would come powerfully upon us, as you would rest above us, and that your presence would be felt among all of us, God. Thank you so much. I pray that as we go along this week, Holy Spirit, that you would remind us who you are and how you love us. In Jesus' name I pray. Thirsty, oh Jesus, we are thirsty.